Hello students, welcome. This is a video about derivatives involving inverse trigonometric functions. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of inverse trigonometric functions. There's actually six of them. Uh, sine inverse, cosine inverse, tangent inverse, cosecant inverse, secant inverse, and cotangent inverse. And notice I'm saying inverse even though it looks like it says sine to the negative one because that's actually the inverse function um, of sine of the the sine function. Now um, taking the derivative is the best way to do it is to just memorize the formulas or in, in the case of a class like mine um, since it's online you have access to all the formulas and um, I have the formulas for your convenience for here in the video but they're also available um, in one of your modules usually the week two or the week three module so if you go on canvas and go to um, if you go to your home page and then you go to start here and scroll down either in week two or week three you're going to see a, a one called formulas from calculus one and two this is a very handy uh, thing here you can download it it's a pdf um, and then you can open that up and it's got all the formulas and don't forget you can zoom in um, pressing the plus button here. So if I zoom in here, we can see under derivatives, um, it's got a lot of nice formulas. Uh, it's got the, the product rule, the quotient rule, um, the chain rule, the inverse function derivative rule, the power rule, the derivative of all the regular trig functions, derivative of logarithms, and then we have the derivatives of the inverse trig functions. Okay, and uh, you don't have to memorize these in my class, but you might need to memorize them in other classes. So you can always come back to this if you ever need to memorize them. Um, but there are six, there are six inverse trig functions, and um, we probably won't see all of them, but we'll see most of them. Um, okay, so let's see an example of using these formulas. Okay, so example. The instructions are find each derivative. Find each derivative. Okay, and for problem number one, we want to find the derivative of y equals cosine inverse of 7x to the fifth power. Okay, so y equals cosine inverse of parentheses 7x to the 5. Okay, so this one is a composite function. So you've got your outer function and your inner function. Um, so the outer function here is going to be cosine. Well, cosine inverse is what I meant to say. So the cosine to the negative 1 is cosine inverse. And then uh, your inner function is going to be 7x to the 5. Okay, so using um, the formula for cosine inverse, let's go back up here, we can see that ddx of cosine inverse of u equals negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared times du dx. And the du dx, that's just part of the chain rule right there. So, um, so they're just doing the chain rule. So it's going to be negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared. Okay, so here our inner function is u. So here our u is 7x to the 5. So our dy dx is going to be the derivative of the outside function, inner left alone. So that's going to be negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared. But of course, we don't write u, we actually write um, the inner function. So instead of writing u squared, um, we're, instead of writing that u squared there, we're actually going to write the inner function, which was 7x to the fifth. Okay, so we have negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus parentheses 7x to the fifth parentheses squared. 
Okay, so that right there is the derivative of the outer function, cosine inverse. And all we did there was we copied down the formula, negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared. u is the inner function, so here our u is 7x to the fifth. And so that gave us this. Now we still have to multiply this times the derivative of the inner function. So right there we did the derivative of the outer function, inner left alone. Now we multiply this times the derivative of the inner function. So what is the derivative of 7x to the 5? Well, we're just going to go ahead and use the power rule. Okay, so we bring the 5 out front, and we decrease the exponent by 1. Okay, so we get 5 times 7 is 35x to the 4th. Okay, so we did, um, in red here, we did the derivative of the outer function, inner left alone, and then we multiply that times the derivative of the inner function. Now you can simplify this a little bit. Um, so what we need to do here is just, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, multiply on the top, and then we're also going to square this thing on the bottom. Okay, so on the top we just have negative 1 times 35x to the 4th, which is going to give us a negative in front of our problem, and then on the top we have 35x to the fourth. Now in our denominator, um, I don't know if you remember this, but if you have multiple factors here and you're raising it to a power, you can actually just go ahead and distribute that power. So we're going to distribute this exponent of 2 to each of those exponents. Okay? So we have negative 35x to the fourth all over the square root of 1 minus, well, 7 squared is 49. And then x to the fifth squared, I don't know if you remember this, but you actually multiply the exponents. So it's going to be 5 times 2 is 10 is our new exponent. So it's going to be 1 minus 49 x to the 10. Okay. And, um, so that was that, and then uh, that's actually how they leave their answer on my math lab, so I'll go ahead and box that. So our final answer here is negative 35x to the fourth all over the square root of 1 minus 49x to the 10. Okay, so let's see some more examples of derivatives of inverse trig functions. So now the one we just did was actually cosine inverse. Um, so I kind of wanted to do one. You do have a fair number of cosine inverses on your homework. But I wanted to do one that wasn't a cosine inverse for the second one. So for number two, let's go ahead and do the derivative of y equals uh, sine inverse y equals sine inverse of root 6 times t. Okay, so y equals sine inverse of the square root of 6 times t. Okay, so to do this problem, uh, we're going to have to use the other formula. So for the first one, we had the derivative of cosine inverse. But for this one, our outer function is actually going to be sine inverse. And it turns out that this is going to have a different formula than the last one. Okay, so our outer function is sine inverse, and our inner function is the square root of 6 times t. Okay, so what is the derivative of sine inverse? It's right here. If you ever forget it, you can look on your formula sheet. It's almost the same as the derivative of cosine inverse. The only difference is um, there isn't a minus in the numerator. Okay, so the derivative of sine inverse is 1 over square root of 1 minus u squared times du dx. Notice that sine inverse and cosine inverse only differ by a minus. Okay, so for sine inverse, we have a positive 1 in the numerator. For cosine inverse, we have a negative one in the numerator. But other than that, those two formulas are identical. 
Okay. So that's a nice thing to know. If you ever do have to memorize it, I know you don't have to memorize it for my class, but if you ever end up having to memorize these, um, it's good to notice that sine inverse and cosine inverse are basically the same formula. It's just cosine inverse has a minus. Okay. So using our formula here, remember our inner function is the same as u. Okay. So we're going to have dy dt because here our, our independent variable is t instead of x. So dy dt equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared. So that's what we just said, the derivative of sine inverse is. Up here, the derivative of sine inverse is 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared. And then because of the chain rule, you have to multiply that times the derivative of the inner function. But here, our u is actually root 6 times t. So instead of writing um, u squared, I'm going to write root 6 times t quantity squared. OK? So there I took the derivative of the outer function, inner left alone. The inner function's in blue there. And then I multiply this times the derivative of the inner function. So what is the derivative of root 6 times t? Um, this is actually a really easy derivative. So the square root of 6 is actually a constant because it doesn't have a variable in it. So this is really just a constant times the variable. So the derivative of a constant times the variable is just going to be the constant. So we're going to multiply this just times root 6. So don't be thrown off by that square root. The only time you have to rewrite a square root as a 1 half power and then use the power rule is if the square root actually includes the variable. Here the variable is not included in the square root. Um, so it's actually just a constant. Root 6 is a constant. Okay? So cool. So then uh, we're almost done with this problem. Uh, they just move this root 6 up to the numerator, and then that's the whole thing. So we have um, dy dt equals root 6 in the numerator over the square root of 1 minus, well, in the denominator, we should distribute the square um, to each of those factors. And what happens when you get root 6 squared? So we're going to have root 6 squared times t squared. I don't know if you remember this, but if you square a square root, the square and the square root cancel out. Okay, so these cancel out, and we just get 6. Okay, so that's going to give us our final answer of root 6 all over the square root of 1 minus 6t squared. Okay, and that's exactly how they wrote it on my math lab, so we're good there. So I always thought these were kind of fun. Um, the hardest thing about them is memorizing the formulas, but since I'm not making you memorize the formulas, remember um, in my class you, you can feel free to just go ahead and use the formula sheet like I have been uh, to make the whole thing a lot easier. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at problem number three. Okay, problem number three. We want to find the derivative of y equals cosine inverse of 2 over x. The derivative of y equals cosine inverse of 2 over x. So once again, we have a composite function. And our outer function is cosine inverse. And our inner function is going to be 2 over x. OK. So first of all, we take the derivative of the outer function, inner left alone. And so we're going to have dy dx equals, well, the derivative of cosine inverse, we just said, was negative 1 over the square root 
of 1 minus u squared. But here our inner function is u. Okay, so this, this function in blue is actually u. Okay, so instead of writing the negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared, instead of that u right there, we're going to write 2 over x instead of that. Okay, so we're going to have um, 2 over x squared right there. Okay, so that was the derivative of the outer function, inner left alone. And now we multiply this times the derivative of the inner function. Now the inner function here is a little bit harder to take the derivative of. Um, so over here on the side, I can work on it. All right, so if you take the derivative of 2 over x, remember that 2 over x is the same as 2 times x to the negative 1. Okay, um, because if you if you move the, the x up to the numerator in order to use the power rule, um, you would think you'd be able to use the power rule here, and you can't. So because we're not integrating, it's not going to be ln of x. Um, so we're going to go ahead and use the power rule. So we go ahead and bring the negative 1 out front, and then we decrease the exponent by 1. Okay, so that's... Uh, if we take the derivative of 2 over x, then when we use the power rule, we bring the negative out front, we get negative 2 x to the negative 2, because we decrease the exponent by 1, so negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. All right, and then uh, we can go ahead and move the x to the negative 2 back to the denominator. So that's going to give us negative 2 over x squared. Okay, so that was actually our u prime there. That was the derivative of u. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and multiply this times du dx, or u prime. Okay, so that's going to give us negative 2 over x squared. Okay, so this is times negative 2 over x squared. Now this problem is a little bit trickier than the last problem um, because we have a bunch of fractions here. So you do need to simplify this stuff. So here's our dy dx, um, but we do need to simplify this fraction in here, which can be a little bit annoying. Um, but on the top here we can multiply. So the negatives cancel up here. And so on the top, we have a 2, positive 2. And we also have an x squared on the bottom. But then we have to deal with this mess right here. So remember, when you have an exponent and it's applied to a fraction, you can distribute that exponent to the numerator and the denominator. OK, so on the top, we're going to have 2 squared, which is 4. OK. And then on the bottom, we're going to have x squared. So all I did in that step was I uh, went ahead and I distributed that square to the top and the bottom of the 2 over x. And that gave me 4 over x squared. Now the thing that we have to do next, which a lot of people don't like, is we have to play games with fractions. So what can we do in terms of fractions to simplify this? Well, inside of the square root, we can actually build these to a common denominator. Okay, so this, instead of writing 1 here, we want it to have the same denominator as 4 over x squared. So instead of just writing 1, we need to multiply the top and the bottom by x squared. Okay, so instead of 1 here, I'm going to write x squared over x squared. Because remember, x squared over x squared is just 1. And now that these have the same denominator, we're going to be left with an x squared minus 4 on the top. And then on the bottom, we have a common denominator of x squared. Okay, so now we have 2 over x squared 
times the square root of x squared minus 4 all over x squared. All right. Now the tricky thing about this is you would think you would be done, but you are not. There's still more stuff to simplify here. So remember, if you have the square root of a fraction, here we have the square root of a fraction, um, you can actually distribute the square root to the top and the bottom. So instead of writing the square root of this whole thing, we can write it as square root of x squared minus 4 on the top, and square root of x squared on the bottom. Okay? And then, um, that's most of the problem. Uh, the only thing that's a little bit strange is um, this square root of x squared is actually going to become absolute value of x. Okay. It's going to become absolute value of x. So I don't know if you remember that, but um, the square root of x squared the square root of x squared is actually equal to absolute value of x because the square root and the square cancel out. Um, but because you're squaring it, that makes sure it's always positive. So that's actually going to be absolute value of x. Okay, so I know that's a little bit weird, but um, that's how it works out. Okay, and then... Uh, so then we're going to be going ahead and we're going to replace, oops, we're going to replace that square root of x squared with absolute value of x. I know this is all very, a little bit strange. It's kind of a strange problem. That's why I wanted to do it is so you could see all the tricks. So now we have 2 over x squared times square root of x squared minus 4 over absolute value of x. Okay, um, but we have a fraction over another fraction. So remember, if you're dividing by a fraction, that's the same as flipping it over and multiplying. So what I did there is I replaced the square root of x squared with absolute value of x, but now I need to flip this entire fraction over. Okay, so if we flip this fraction in the denominator, because we're dividing by a fraction, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, or the flip. We're going to end up with this absolute value of x in the numerator. Okay, so in the numerator we have 2 times absolute value of x. And then in the denominator we still have x squared times the square root of x squared minus 4. Now you're going to see one of the strangest things in this entire chapter right now. So a lot of people are not very familiar with absolute value and how they work. But um, it turns out that x squared is actually the same as absolute value of x squared, which is, I know that sounds very strange, but um, that's just an important note here. So note x squared is the same as absolute value of x squared. Now the reason that's true is if you square anything it makes it positive. Oh, it's either going to be zero or positive, it can't be negative. Um, so that's why absolute value of x squared is the same as x squared. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to replace this x squared with absolute value of x squared. And the reason I want to do that is I want to cancel out this absolute value of x on the top with um, one of the factors on the bottom. Okay, so instead of x squared, I'm writing absolute value of x squared on the bottom. And then we can just cancel them out. Okay, so we have an absolute value of x on the top and an absolute value of x squared on the bottom. So those cancel out and we're left with an absolute value of x on the bottom. And I wouldn't be such a stickler about the absolute value, except you have to be, because that's what my, my math lab does. 
Um, so you do have to write the absolute value. But this brings us to our final answer. So we have 2 over absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 4. Okay, and that's our dy dx. So I'll go ahead and box that. This is our dy dx. Okay, so again, just to recap with the whole absolute value stuff, I know it's confusing. If you take the square root of x squared, x squared automatically makes everything positive. Okay, so um, that x squared is going to be positive anyway. In other words, it's the same as the absolute value. Because the absolute value is either 0 or positive, and the square root of x squared, because of the squared, is going to be either 0 or positive. So these are the same thing. So that's how we replace that one with the absolute value of x. And then we flipped over the fraction. And then over here, again, because x squared is always going to be 0 or positive, x squared is the same as absolute value of x squared. OK, so that's how we got this. Um, we had an x squared in the denominator, but we replaced that with absolute value of x squared. And that canceled out with this absolute value of x on the top. And that brought us to our final answer, which is 2 over absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 4. And remember, you can rewatch this video if you need me to go over it again. Uh, because, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to learn that stuff online. Okay, so that was our problem number three, right? Yes, that was number three. Okay, so let's take a look at problem number four. Example number four. So for this one, we want to take the derivative of y equals cotangent inverse. Okay, y equals cotangent inverse of the square root of 3t. Okay, so we are going to have a new formula here, the one for cotangent inverse. So our dy dt, using the, um, using the chain rule, it's going to be the derivative of the outer function, inner left alone, times the derivative of the inner function. Okay, so here our outer function is cotangent. And uh, you got to be careful here. Our inner function is actually root 3t. Now, I know that looks a lot like an earlier problem that we did, um, problem number two. But notice with this one, the square root actually goes around the t. So with problem number two, if I go back up to problem number two, uh, we had square root of 6 times t, but this square root did not go around the t. Uh, but with this one, with problem number four, the square root includes both the constant and the t. So um, this actually means root 3 times root t. Okay, so this means root 3 times root t, which is going to make that inner derivative a bit harder. OK, but let's start by taking the derivative of the outer function. So here our outer function is cotangent inverse. And again, uh, if you don't always want to watch this video, you can go on Canvas and download the, the PDF. Some people even print out this PDF with all the formulas. And you just go on the first page under derivatives. And we look for the derivative of cotangent inverse of u. And we can see here that that's going to be negative 1 over 1 plus u squared times du dx. Negative 1 over 1 plus u squared. Okay, so negative 1 over 1 plus u squared. And of course, our inner function is the same as u. Okay, so here u is going to be the square root of 3t. So I'm going to go ahead and replace that u there with the square root of 3t. Okay, so we have 
negative 1 over 1 plus the quantity square root of 3t, quantity squared. All right. And then uh, that was the derivative of the outer function, inner left alone. Now we multiply this times the derivative of the inner function. So we're going to multiply this times u prime or du dt. So now here u is actually root 3t, root 3t, which is the same as root 3 times root t. So if you're trying to take the derivative of root 3 times root t, you need to rewrite the root t as an exponent so you can use the power rule. Okay, so instead of writing the square root of t, we're going to write root 3 times t to the 1 half. You don't need to write 3 to the 1 half because that's a constant. It's just going to stay the same. But you do need to write, um, instead of square root of t, you write it as t to the 1 half power. And then to take the derivative here, if we take the derivative of this, we're going to go ahead and bring that exponent out front and decrease it by 1. Okay, so that's going to give us um, root 3 over 2. Well, it's really root 3 times 1 half, which is the same as root 3 over 2. And then we have times t to the, well, 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. Okay, so we have root 3 over 2 times t to the negative 1 half. And you might think you're done, but you, you want to go ahead and move this t to the negative 1 half down to the bottom. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So if we move this to the denominator, then we're going to have root 3 on the top, and then on the bottom, oops, on the bottom, we're going to have 2 times the square root of t. Okay, so that was our u prime. or our du dt. This is our u prime. Okay, so we can go ahead and plug that in over here into the original problem. So plugging in, we're going to replace that u prime with uh, root 3 over 2 root t. Okay. So, um, hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Um, if not, feel free to rewatch my videos or come to my office hours. Okay, so um, we can simplify this though. So for this, uh, this bit right here, we can actually square the square root and those are gonna cancel out. Okay, so this, this square root and that square cancel out. Um, and so that's just going to give you uh, 1 plus 3t. It's actually technically an absolute value. Okay. Um, so we have negative 1 over 1 plus absolute value of 3t. Um, but because 3 is already a positive number, we can bring the 3 outside of the absolute value. So we have 1 plus 3 times absolute value of t. Okay. And then, um, and then over here, we still have a root 3 over 2 times root t. Okay, so we have root 3 over 2 times root t. So what do we do with all this? Um, well, actually, what we can do here is uh, you don't need to distribute in the denominator. You're just going to go ahead and multiply the fractions straight across. Okay, so in our numerator, we're going to have root 3. And then in our denominator, we can put parentheses around the 1 plus 3 times absolute value of t. So in our denominator, we're actually going to have... Um, 2 root t times the quantity 1 plus 3 absolute value of t. Okay, and you might think that you would leave your answer like that, but it's a bit of a strange problem because um, 
they want you to go ahead and get rid of the square root of three on the top, which is, I know, a little bit strange, but um, basically they're having you rationalize the numerator uh, on my math lab. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, so we're gonna multiply the top and the bottom by root three. So why am I multiplying the top and the bottom by root three? Well, um, this is just how they did it on my math lab. It's kind of arbitrary, but um, they're trying to get rid of the root three on the top so that they don't have a radical on the top and the bottom, which is just a little bit weird, I know, but that's what they're having us do. So on the top, the root three and the root three cancel out and just give us three. Okay, so on the top we have negative three, and then on the bottom, we can combine this root three with the root t. So we can write it as negative two times the square root of three t times the quantity one plus three times absolute value of t. Pretty cool, huh? And um, on my math lab, they don't have an absolute value which is kind of interesting. Um, I think the reason they don't have an absolute value um, around the T might have something to do with the fact that um, we have a square root here. So if T were negative, then um, this square root would not be defined anyway. So we don't need the absolute value uh, because we already have a square root here. So um, I know in the last problem we did have an absolute value and we kept it, but that was actually because um, we didn't end up with a square root in our answer. All right, so because we have this square root right here, this means t can't be negative. Why can't t be negative? Well, um, because in the square root, you can't have a negative on the inside. So because t can't be negative, that means um, we don't need this absolute value. Because remember, absolute value makes something either zero or positive, but if something can't be negative anyway, we don't need the absolute value. Okay, so we do not need this. So we don't need the absolute value because t is already zero or positive. So I know that's, that's very strange, um, but that's how square roots work. So this, this function would not even be defined if t were negative. Um, so we don't need the absolute value because t can't be negative. The function isn't defined when it's negative. All right, so our final answer is actually not gonna have an absolute value. So let me write that over here. So I'll cross out that absolute value and we get our final answer is going to be dy dt equals negative three over two times the square root of three t times a quantity one plus three t. And again, we don't need the absolute value because of that square root, because t can't be negative anyway. It's not defined. Okay, so that's gonna be our final answer. And normally, if I were teaching a class that didn't use my math lab, I wouldn't make such a big deal about the absolute value stuff, but I need to because my math lab is very strict about it. So here on this problem, uh, we don't need to write an absolute value in our answer. Pretty cool, huh? So, uh, I guess that was my number four. Yep, we just did number four. So I just wanted to do a couple more to make sure you're good for all your homework. Okay, so for number five, for problem number five, we want to find the derivative of y 
equals natural log of the quantity tan inverse of the quantity 2x cubed n parentheses n parentheses so ln of parentheses tan inverse of parentheses 2x cubed so here we actually have two sets of parentheses. So this problem is, I want to say it's probably the hardest one on your homework um, because it's got, you know, three functions squished into one. But as always, when you have multiple functions with another function inside of another function, you use the chain rule. Okay, so here we've got our outer function, which is going to be ln. And then we have our middle function. So here our middle function is tan inverse. And then we have our inner function, which is 2x cubed. Now I don't like to do a lot of hard problems like this on uh, your homework and definitely not on the test. But it's good to see one now and then because you do see them sometimes in the real world. Um, Sometimes when you're modeling something, it ends up being very complicated. Okay, but we're going to go ahead and use the chain rule, which is you take the derivative of the outermost function and you work your way inward until you've gotten to the middle. Okay. So chain rule. Take derivative of outermost function and then work inward. Okay, so you're going to be doing the derivative of the outer function, middle and inner left alone, and then you're going to multiply that times the derivative of the middle function, inner left alone, and then finally you're going to multiply that times the derivative of the inner function. Okay, and I know we've done examples like this before, but this one is a very difficult one for some people because it's just got so many different functions. Okay, but let's start with the outer function. So remember that the derivative of ln is 1 over. Okay, so in red here, my dy dx, dy dx, well, the derivative of my outer function is just going to be 1 over my middle and inner function. Okay, so the derivative of ln is 1 over, and then I have 1 over my middle and inner function. So it's going to be 1 over tan inverse of 2x cubed. Okay, 1 over tan inverse of 2x cubed. So all I did there was I took the derivative of the outer function, middle and inner left alone. Now we multiply this times the derivative of the middle function, inner left alone. Okay, so the derivative of tan inverse, we're going to need a formula for that. So going back to our formula sheet, if we go for derivatives on the first page, and we go down to the ddx of tan inverse of u, that gives you 1 over 1 plus u squared du dx. And for people who do like to memorize the formulas, Notice that this one is almost identical to the derivative of cotangent inverse. The only difference is the derivative of cotangent inverse has a negative 1, and the derivative of uh, tan inverse has a positive 1. But they're still both 1 over 1 plus u squared. Okay, so um, here we're going to have 1 over 1 plus u squared. 1 over 1 plus u squared. But here our u is actually going to be our inner function. So here u is going to be the 2x cubed. Okay, that, that's that green function there. All right, so instead of 1 over 1 plus u squared, I'm going to have 1 over 1 plus the green function squared, which we just said was 2x cubed. 
Okay, so 1 over 1 plus 2x cubed squared. Okay, so that's the derivative of uh, the middle function, inner left alone. And finally, we multiply this times the derivative of the inner function. In other words, that's our, our u prime. So this is going to be times u prime. So what's the derivative of 2x cubed? Well, we just go ahead and use the power rule. So we bring the 3 out front, and we decrease the exponent by 1. So 3 times 2 is 6x squared. So we should have 6x squared for our u prime. All right, so just to recap that, it's a hard problem, mostly just to, to do the whole thing. To recap, we have three functions in one. You got your outer, your middle, and your inner. And then with the chain rule, you take the derivative of the outer function and you work inward. So we started with the derivative of ln, which was 1 over the middle and the inner function. And then we multiplied this times the derivative of the middle function, which was 1 over 1 plus u squared. Here our u was 2x cubed. And then finally, we multiplied that times the derivative of the inner function, in other words, u prime. So that was the derivative of 2x cubed. Okay, and somehow I managed to fit all of that on one line, which is good. All right, now you do have to simplify this a little bit. So the main thing you have to simplify here is you need to distribute this square to each of those exponents. All right, so you're gonna get uh, two squared is four, and then multiplying the exponents uh, 3 times 2 is 6, so you you're going to have 4 times x to the 6 for this bit right here. Okay? And then because this has two terms down here, I'm going to go ahead and put parentheses around it. All right, and then I'm going to go ahead and write in the order that my math lab does. So remember, when you're multiplying fractions, you multiply straight across. So on the top here, we just have 1 times 1 times 6x squared. So our numerator is going to be 6x squared. And then in our denominator, um, they put parentheses around the tan inverse of 2x cubed. Okay? Tan inverse of 2x cubed. The reason they put parentheses around it is it's just to, to make it easier to read. Um, and then we also have this bit right here. So that's going to be, um, the other thing in the denominator is going to be 1 plus, while distributing that square, we're going to have 2 squared is 4. And then again, if you're raising an exponent to a power, you multiply the exponents. So we're going to have x to the 3 times 2 is x to the 6. Okay, so we have 6x squared all over tan inverse of 2x cubed times the quantity 1 plus 4x to the 6. And there are always harder and harder problems in math. Sometimes I like to not do too many of them, but occasionally I'll do a hard one like this. Um, it's just difficult when people are having to learn things online, so I tend to try to do fewer of the crazy problems. Otherwise, it can be overwhelming for students. All right, but that is that, um, so we finished that problem. Okay, and I just wanted to do one more problem. This next one is going to be um, our last one on this lecture. Okay, so number six, problem number six. We wanna find the derivative of y equals cosecant inverse of e to the 11t. Find the derivative of y equals cosecant inverse of e to the 11t. Okay, so uh, this one's actually a bit easier than the last problem. That last problem was 
a little bit harder. Now this one is technically three functions in one, but our inner function is not so bad. Um, it's just 11t, so we don't even have to use a power rule there. Okay, but we do have three functions in one. So our outermost function is cosecant inverse. Then our middle function is going to be e. Okay, and then our inner function is going to be 11t. All right, but the, the thing that's a little bit strange about this one is um, our u is actually going to be the middle and the inner combined. So that's why I wanted to do this problem, because that can throw people off. Okay, so here, um, because we have cosecant inverse of u, we need to let u be whatever's inside of the inverse trig function. So here we're really taking the derivative of y equals cosecant inverse of u. Okay, but here our u, instead of just being one function, it's actually a function within another function. Okay, so u is actually equal to e to the 11t. I just wanted to do this because it can throw people off with the formula. Okay, so let's go back to our formula sheet. We're going to look for the derivative of y equals cosecant inverse of u. So uh, the derivative of cosecant inverse of u, that's a typo right there, by the way, in the formula sheet. That's supposed to say cosecant inverse of u. Um, it's actually equal to negative 1 over absolute value of u times the square root of u squared minus 1 times du dx. And we're not actually going to do secant inverse in this lecture, but if you do ever encounter it, it's almost the same formula as cosecant inverse. The only difference, once again, is cosecant inverse, the derivative has a negative 1 on the top, whereas secant inverse has a positive 1 on the top. But the rest of it is, is still over absolute value of u times the square root of u squared minus 1 times du dx. Well, that's the same thing here. We still have an absolute value of u and a square root of u squared minus 1 on the bottom and then times du dx. Okay, but this is the one we're going to be using here. So derivative of cosecant inverse of u is going to be uh, negative 1 over absolute value of u times the square root of u squared minus 1. Okay, that's going to be the derivative of our outermost function. So negative 1 over absolute value of u times the square root of u squared minus 1. So good, we wrote it down, right? But then the tricky part about this problem is the middle and the inner function are actually our u. Because they're both inside of the outer function, which is cosecant inverse. Okay, so here u is actually going to be e to the 11t. Okay, so we're going to have this whole thing times u prime. Okay, or, or as they said on there, du dx, or um, here it's going to be du dt. Okay, but this one's hard enough that I'm actually trying to write it in terms of u, um, just so that hopefully you don't get too confused. So what we can do is, um, for the middle and the inner function, e to the 11t, we can go ahead and take the derivative of u. Okay, so if I take the derivative here, we're going to get du dt equals, well, remember, the derivative of e to a variable is just e to that variable. So that's just going to be e to the 11t, but then we have to multiply this by the chain rule times the derivative of 11t. So what's the derivative of 11t? Well, uh, the derivative of a constant times a variable is just the constant. So it's going to be times 11. Sorry, my son cries a lot. Um, my wife is taking care of him, but um, he's going through a very uh, crybaby phase. He's, he's one month old at the time I'm making this video. So he can't seem to eat enough. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so anyway, what we got here is um, we've got 11 e to the 11 t, and that's our du dt. Okay, so um, writing everything in terms of u is going to be helpful here because it's so complicated. So now I'm going to go ahead and plug everything in. All right, so we've got um, negative 1 over absolute value of u. So that's going to be negative 1 over absolute value of e to the 11t. Let me give myself some more room here. So negative 1 over absolute value of e to the 11t times the square root of e to the 11t squared minus 1. Okay, and then we multiply this times du dt. But we went ahead and we calculated du dt over here, and we said that was 11 e to the 11t. And here, that, that du dt is the same as the derivative of the middle function, inner left alone, times the derivative of the inner function, which was just 11. Okay, so that's what we did there in green. Okay, so what we have here is it's times 11 e to the 11 t. And uh, probably the hardest part about this problem, other than setting it up, is to just um, to be able to simplify this, this mess here. Um, but it's, it's actually not that hard if you remember your exponential functions. Um, so uh, what we can do is this absolute value of e to the 11t on the bottom, that is actually just going to be the same as e to the 11t. Okay, so since um, e to the x is greater than zero for all x. Well, instead of e to the x, I can call it e to the 11t because 11 is a, a positive number. So since e to the 11t is greater than zero for all t, that means that we, we don't need the absolute value. Okay, so we don't need don't need absolute value because remember what absolute value does is it makes sure things are positive. They can only be zero or positive if they're inside of the absolute value. But because um, a function e to the 11t is always greater than zero anyway, it's already positive. So we don't need to write the absolute value. So I can actually just cross out these absolute values right there. Okay, so then on the top, we're going to have negative 11 e to the 11 t. And on the bottom, we have e to the 11 t times the square root of, well, what do we do with this e to the 11 t squared? Once again, if you're raising an exponent to a power, you multiply the exponents. So if I distribute this square here, um, we're going to be multiplying the exponent. So 2 times 11t is 22t. So we're actually going to get e to the 22t minus 1. Okay, and the reason I got rid of that absolute value is so now I could, could cross these two out. So now we notice that we have an e to the 11t on the top and the bottom. So those actually just cancel out. So we wind up with negative 11 over the square root of e to the 22t minus 1. Okay, so negative 11 all over the square root of e to the 22t minus 1. Oh man, I'm having trouble writing. I think I had too much coffee. <laughs> okay. All right. But that is that's our final answer. So that's our dy dt there.
Okay, so dy dt. All right, so that finishes that lecture. Thanks for watching.